the, uh, the lesson, uh, so to speak, this morning is going to be a little bit un uh, more un unorthodox than, than we have in the past. Um, I guess you could say announcements has been broken up into three sections today. The part that I've already done, the part that I'm about to do, and then the part at the conclusion. But as everyone is aware, and as you can see from the screen, we start um, our new annual theme today of one another. Why did we pick one another? How many people in here are so glad 2020 is over with? Generally, that's the case on almost any year. But this one, uh, more so than others. We have seen more things this year, this past year, than, than I would say we would care to see. We have uh, the pandemic, the presidential election. Those were the two main points. But we have seen the good come out in a lot of people because of what we faced in 2020. But on the flip side, we've also seen the bad come out in a lot of people. The pandemic that caused uh, a, a ruckus in the church, in fact, I think it still, still is today. There's a debate going on on whether or not it's scriptural to meet via Zoom, to take the Lord's Supper individually, and things along those lines. Paul and I thought long and hard and prayed long and hard and came to the conclusions that we did. And there are still differing opinions, and we understand that. There's always going to be differing opinions. But with the way that everything was kind of magnified this past year and elevated, we got to thinking, in fact, it was a, a suggestion from PJ on our theme for this year of one another. I don't know if you've noticed, but on our prayer list, one another has been on our prayer list for years. And it's something that we've tried to promote for quite a long time. But this year, we're going to focus more on it. Because no more so than now is the thought of one another that important. There will be a day that we pray for where we will all be back together assembled under one roof. That's what we're shooting for, and that's what we're praying for. But unfortunately, that is not the case right now. Not until certain things happen, certain things are taken care of. Whether it be six months, whether it be a year, whether it be another two years. But we need to focus on one another. Never has Satan been more active than he has this past year. You stop and think about that for a moment. The opportunities that were presented to Satan this past year, I can just imagine he was licking his chops. So we want to focus on one another. Have you, if everyone has a booklet uh, from last week, and if you don't, we'll get you one. But I would like to, for, to read just a passage or just a couple of the things that are in this booklet. And then we'll get into um, the main thought for this morning. Here at Kaysville, our goal for the year is to emphasize the theme of one another. In the face of the many challenges and trials that 2020 brought to us, we have learned just how important the family of God is. We've come to realize that the church is not a building to be occupied but a family of believers with whom we share joy, struggles, and worship. We need one another. We depend on one another. Life as a Christian is nothing short of a one another lifestyle. This year we will focus not just on our relationships with each other, but also on our behavior toward and responsibilities to one another. Some of the lessons will challenge us but in turn they will activate each and every member to recognize the expectations that the Lord has given to his church. How can we better love one another? How can we bear the burdens of our family members? 
How do we live in harmony with such a large and diverse group of believers? These are just some of the one another's that we will be exploring along with many more. God didn't put us on this earth to survive spiritually in isolation. So let's grow together and be committed to one another for 2021 and beyond. I want to repeat that last um, sentence. God didn't put us on this earth to survive spiritually in isolation. And if you recall, that's what PJ uh, focused his thoughts on last week, was the individual. All individual Christians have a function. No individual Christian can function effectively in isolation. And no individual Christian should feel more important than any other. All individual Christians must work hard at creating and keeping unity. And that's where I'd like for us to start uh, our thought for this morning is in the creating and keeping unity. If you would be turning over in your Bible to Philippians, the first chapter. We're going to focus our thoughts on one passage, one scripture. That's it. Philippians 1, verse 27. It reads, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. I don't know if you noticed, but there are three key thoughts in this verse. And we're going to look at each, each key thought real quick for just the next few minutes. The first one is conduct that is worthy of the gospel. When Paul said, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, he was literally saying, as in the translation from the Greek, act as citizens in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And we're going to get to that word citizen here in just a minute. But the Greek word, Paul at Ua, literally means to be a citizen or to live as a citizen, but not as a citizen here on earth. We know that to be the case. Philippians 3, verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. Sorry, I fell behind on my slide. And then in 1 Peter 2, verse 11 and 12, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. When, uh, when it's stated here that your conduct is to be worthy of the gospel, what does that mean? Worthy literally means of equal weight or value. So what Paul is teaching them here is to conduct themselves as in accordance with the characteristics of the heavenly community. And we all know what the heavenly community is. We are the traits of that. We just spent the last 52 weeks looking at that, on how we should conduct ourselves and the traits that should accompany being a Christian. The next key thought that's associated with that is to stand fast. Some in here uh, have not had the privilege of having children yet. Some of people in here um, have had that privilege. But all of us have been a child at one point. What does a child do when they don't want to do something? What's the first thing that a child does when it's holding and when it doesn't, a, a young newborn, when you're holding it and it doesn't get its way and it starts crying? Stiffens its back, right? At least mine did. <laughs> I don't know if I did, but I was told that I did. Um, Anyway, we won't get into, into that one of me as a child. 
But anyway, standing fast has that um, a characteristic to it, where you're standing firm. You can't be moved. I'm going to get to something that's going to illustrate that in just a minute. But in this, when Paul is saying, he's saying, stand fast in one spirit with one mind. It is very important that Christians stand fast in what, in what we believe and in our determination to live according to that belief. If you would turn over to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now turn over, if you would, to Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Ephesians chapter 6. We'll read uh, verses 11 thir and then 13 through 18. Ephesians 6 verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then skipping 12 and, and going to 13. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand therefore... Having, your, your, uh, having girded your waist in truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, of which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So we see here that there's armor that we have, but also there's the indication that this is a battle. This is something that we have to fight. This is something that we must fight. We must stand, and we must stand fast, stand firm, as some in, uh, versions uh, translate it. Stand firm against the devil. And the part that uh, PJ referenced uh, in his last point last week, that all individual Christians must work hard at creating and keeping unity. Unity is, is dripping all over this verse. We all need to be united in one purpose. Note again how he says... In Philippians 1.27, he said uh, about what midway through, that you stand fast in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, we reference battle in Ephesians 6. Striving together carries that connotation as well. But before we get to that, let's look at the unity group is emphasized by those three expressions. One spirit, one mind, striving together. Paul instruct the instructed the Philippians to stand fast in one spirit, one mind, but in simpler terms, it means to stand fast in one purpose of heart. We are all joined together in one purpose of heart. The expression in one spirit seems to be nearly an exact synonym of in one mind. I know some translations will, will translate uh, spirit, mind, it might be uh, one soul uh, in there in, as well. Uh, and these are all spirit, mind, and soul are often used interchangeably in the Bible, and the translators often use them interchangeably as well. But what's the natural conclusion from all of this? Turn over, if you would, to Acts 4. In Acts 4 and verse 32, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. 
And then back over to 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, it says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. The Philippians were to be striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, what does that mean, the faith of the gospel? Our striving is to be done for the faith. Okay? or in the faith, which directly relates to our level of interest. There are many good causes in this world, many, but none of them, none of them should supplant or supersede the striving of Christians to be exerted for the faith. The faith of the gospel, the faith is the gospel. The faith is the full sum of what we believe and practice as it's revealed by our Lord and Savior. Striving together is an athletic term that refers to a spirit of cooperation, love, mutual respect, and devotion. It points out that the relationship between Christians is to be a friendship, or as the Bible describes it, a fellowship. A sharing together of good times and bad. This was taken from, uh, I believe his name is Roger Hillis, who wrote the uh, textbook, uh, One Another Christianity. Uh, he wrote in there, he said, someone once said that coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. But working together is success. When you think of that, attitude of, a, of an athletic term, uh, everybody uh, united in one purpose. You know, I don't know how many um, college football uh, fans are in here, but we're in the, in the playoffs. In fact, uh, the national championship has now been set because of this past weekend. Um, but imagine what would happen, and as usual, uh, seems about every year, Alabama will once again be in the national championship game. Good for them because they are going to prove my point this morning, okay? And Jeff Pascal will probably be rolling over in disbelief uh, to hear me talking favorably about Alabama. But imagine what would happen if the offense or the defense for Alabama, as they were lined up in their respective role at their respective time, that one person decided he was gonna sit down and not do his job. Or that one person would say, well, I don't block as well as Joe next to me, so I'm going to kind of let Joe take these three guys. What's going to happen? Well, there's probably going to be a turnover. There's going to be a loss of yardage. Uh, they're not going to uh, reach their goal. The same thing is with us. It doesn't matter what you can do or what you cannot do, as long as we do. And we all need to come together and find out what that is and do it together. If you take the, uh, the emblem for our one another, you see that where everybody's holding hands? You see that? If you were to, to break that circle and make it a, a straight line, does that remind you of a certain grade school playground game? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Red exactly. Red Rover. Red Rover, Red Rover. What's the purpose of that game? The purpose of that game is to break that bond. So those that are standing in line, the person that comes through, they pick, two, that, that one person picks two people that they feel might be the easiest to break, kind of like Satan does. They pick two people and they try to break that bond that they have. 
If they do, then those two people join their team. If they can't break that bond, then they, then they have to join that team. My point is, is that as we go forward, um, it's going to be kind of like that playground game, Red Rover. But we're not, we're not calling Satan over. He's coming over on his own. And we don't want that line to break. And each one of us needs to come together in order for that not to break. We're going to be looking at a lot more about this through the coming weeks. But we're just kind of setting the stages now. But this is the spirit of teamwork that we need to have in this body of saints here at Kaysville. In 1 Corinthians 1.10 that um, PJ read for us last week, or referenced last week, it says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So in summary, the Christian life requires, yea, demands, effort, discipline, and exertion. And in just a moment, uh, Scott will be leading us in our song of encouragement. But then we'll get into the uh, third portion uh, of our announcements here this morning, of the lesson here this morning. Uh, and we'll look at the book and, um, and also have a few uh, closing comments. So with that, I know that this hasn't uh, uh, been a lesson that was designed, uh, well, yes, it was, designed to prick someone's heart. Um, it was more of a lesson on uh, an explanation on why we have the theme that we do going forward. But we never want to let an opportunity pass of anyone being here this morning that needs to make a change in their life for whatever reason. And um, if for some reason that you would like to uh, ask for the prayers of the congregation uh, for any reason, if you need to make a life-changing uh, decision and, and ask for prayers on, on that, uh, you're welcome to come uh, and make that known. And then we would invite everyone now, if you would, to stand while we sing the song of encouragement. 